Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter of 2023. Lesson 8 from the series on the book of Ephesians is titled Christ-Shaped Lives and Spirit-Inspired Speech. It's ready for teaching on August 19, written by John McVeigh. Your reader today is Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, August 12. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus came, that he lived, he died, he rose again. But after that the apostles, particularly the apostle Paul, was able to detail for us what the gospel is all about and how it changes lives, how our lives become Christ-like and we develop a different way of speaking, more spirit-inspired speech. Lord, as we open your word this week, we pray that we may see what is in this lesson, which is going to be such a benefit for each of us and for those that we love and those that we share Jesus with. Today, I'd like to pray for Jeremy and Ingrid Cupido in South Africa and Beulah and Martin from Jamaica and Manelli Zitina and her family and Nita Wolf Graham and Lorna Martin in Antigua and... Non La Bata Mbenge from South Africa, Vanessa from Zambia, Pauline Beckford and Diane and Joel, Victor Allen from the Bahamas, Wilson Aganda from Hyderabad in India, Bruce Matthew de Silva, Jeffron Carber from Dominica, and Margaret Molinelli from Libby in Montana in the United States. And wherever people are listening, Lord, I pray that you will be with them today, that this may be a lesson which not only changes lives, but points people toward Jesus. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 to 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Let's read that again. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Jose Antonio lived on the streets of Parma in Spain as a homeless man for years. With grey, straggly hair and beard, Jose looked older than his 57 years. One day, Selva Garcia, the owner of a hair salon, approached Jose and proposed a complete makeover. With Jose in the salon chair, a hard-working team cut, dyed and styled the tangled bundles of hair and beard. Next, Jose then got new stylish clothes. Then came the reveal. As Jose sat in front of a mirror, tears came. Is this me? I'm so different. No one is going to recognise me. Later, he would add, it wasn't just a change of looks. It changed my life. In Ephesians 4, 17-32, Paul argues that believers have experienced a complete transformation. They have taken off their old selves and have embraced their new identity. Something like Jose's change, though, this is not mere external transformation. It includes being renewed in the spirit of your minds, as we read in our text today in Ephesians 4.23, bringing into the life true righteousness and holiness, as in verse 24. This is the ultimate makeover. Sunday, August 13, The Downward Spiral of Sin Compare Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 to 32, and Colossians 3, 1 to 17. 
How does Paul advocate for believers to live in a way that encourages the unity of the church? Well, let's have a look first at Ephesians 4, beginning at verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man who grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbour, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labour, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamour, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And we compare that with Colossians 3, 1 to 17. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now... You yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge, according to the image of him who created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised nor uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But after all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In the prior section, Ephesians 4, 1-16, Paul's theme was the unity of the church. When we compare Ephesians 4, verse 1 and Ephesians 4, 17, we note how similar these two exhortations are about how to walk or to live. 
Ephesians 4 verse 1 reads, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And we compare that with Ephesians 4 and verse 17, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. This resemblance suggests that Paul addresses the same theme, unity and the lifestyle that supports it, but from a new and initially more negative vantage point. In Ephesians 4, 17-24, Paul contrasts Gentile lifestyle, which he regards as undermining unity in verses 17-19, with truly Christian patterns of life that nourish it in verses 20-24. As we read Paul's sharp critique of the depraved Gentile lifestyle, we should recall his conviction that Gentiles are redeemed by God through Christ and offer full partnership in the people of God, as we read in Ephesians 2, 11 to 22. <clears throat> and that reads, Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have been brought near, by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, therefore putting to death the enmity. And he came, and preached peace to you who were afar off, and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit, and we compare that with Ephesians 3, verses 1 to 13. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Christ Jesus, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. In Ephesians 4, verses 17 to 19, our text for today, then, is offered a limited and negative description of Gentiles in the flesh, as recorded in Ephesians 2.11. Paul is not just concerned about specific sins or behaviours exhibited by Gentiles. He is concerned about a pattern of behaviour that they exhibit, a downward trajectory of living in the grip of sin. 
At the heart of Ephesians 4, 17-19 is a portrait of a calloused spirituality. As it says in the New King James Version in verses 17 and 18, in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. This calloused spirituality is the source of the darkened understanding highlighted at the beginning of the passage because of the ignorance which is in them due to their hardness of heart they have become callous ephesians 4:18 and 19 as in the esv and the depraved sexual practice underlined at the end in the same translation verse 9 and have given themselves up to sensuality greedy to practice every kind of impurity Alienated from God, they don't know how to live, and separated from His saving grace, they continue in a downward spiral of sin and depravity. And so to finish the day, what has been your own experience with the power of sin to continue to drag a person downward into even more sin? Monday, August 14, A Dramatic Change of Clothing In retelling the story of the conversion of his audience, what essential main point is Paul getting across to them? Ephesians 4, verses 20 to 24, But you have not so learned in Christ, if indeed you have heard him, and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Having described their former Gentile existence in verses 17 to 19, Paul does not say, that is not the way you learned about Christ. Instead, he exclaimed, that is not the way you learned Christ in verse 20. Noting that the addressees heard him, Christ, and were taught in him in verse 21, or by him in the King James Version, Paul further advocates the adoption of a Christ-shaped life with the phrase, as the truth is in Jesus, in verse 21. For Paul, coming to faith, centres on a personal connection with Christ, one so vivid and real that it may be described as learning Christ. We acknowledge that the risen and exalted Jesus is alive and present with us. We are shaped by his teachings and example and exercise loyalty to him as our living Lord. We open our lives to his active guidance and direction through the Spirit and Word. Paul tells us that the adoption of a Christ-shaped life requires three processes which he expresses through clothing imagery. One to put off or turn away from the old way of life, in verse 22, two, to experience inner renewal, in verse 23, and three, to put on the new godlike pattern of life, in verse 24. Paul's metaphor reflects the use of clothing in the Old Testament as a symbol for both sinfulness and salvation. The times it's referred to as sinfulness, we can have a look at some of these. Psalm 73, verse 6, Therefore pride serves as their necklace, violence covers them like a garment. And Zechariah 3, verses 3 and 4, Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him, And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And Malachi 2 verse 16. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garments with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. 
And then the garments as salvation. We read in Isaiah 61 verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. And Ezekiel 16 verse 8, When I passed by you again and looked upon you, indeed your time was the time of love. So I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine, says the Lord God. And Zechariah 3, verses 4 and 5. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head, and they put the clothes on him, and the angel of the Lord stood by. In ancient times, men wore a knee-length tunic as an undergarment and a cloak or mantle to offer protection from the sun. Similarly, women wore a tunic and a robe. The cultures reflected in the Bible were subsistence ones. Garments were precious and expensive and were kept for a long time. It would have been unusual to own more than one set of clothing. The quality and style of those garments signalled identity and status markers about the wearer. To change one's clothes, exchanging one set of clothes for another, was an unusual and important event, rather than the trifling occurrence it is in many cultures today. Paul imagines the change in life to be as noticeable as exchanging one set of clothing for another would have been in this first century context. And so to finish the day, what is the difference, the crucial difference between learning about Christ and learning to know Christ? Tuesday, August 15, Unity Building, Grace-Filled Speech Which of Paul's words of counsel with regard to the use of speech among believers is the most important to you just now? Why? Well, let's read Ephesians 4, verses 25 to 29. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbour, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labour, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Paul repeatedly uses an interesting structure in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 to 32, which is illustrated in Ephesians 4.25. A negative command, putting away lying. A positive command next, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbour. And then a rationale, for we are members of one another which seems to mean because we are members of one body and so related to one another as parts of that one body. Paul's exhortation to speak truth is not an invitation to confront other church members with a tactless recitation of facts. Paul alludes to Zechariah 8.16, which exhorts speaking the truth as a way of fostering peace. Let's read that text, Zechariah 8.16. These are the things you shall do. Speak each man the truth to his neighbour. Give judgment in your gates for truth, justice and peace. Since in Ephesians 4.31 Paul banishes anger and angry speech, his words in Ephesians 4.26 provide no permission to exercise anger within the congregation. Rather, Paul concedes the possibility of anger while limiting its expression with the sense, should you become angry, do not allow it to bear fruit in full-blown sin. 
Paul appears to interrupt his theme of speech with a negative command about thieves. Let the thief no longer steal, in Ephesians 4.28. Positively, the thief is to labour doing honest work with his own hands in the same verse. We also see something like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 12, and we labour working with our hands, being reviled we bless, being persecuted we endure. And in 1 Thessalonians four eleven, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. And this is based on the rationale so that he may have something to share with anyone in need in Ephesians 4.28. Perhaps Paul includes this word about thieves here because of the connection between theft and deceptive speech as illustrated by the story of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5.1-11. Paul's faith in Christ's transforming power is so strong that he envisions thieves becoming benefactors. Paul then commands, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, in verse 29, which describes a destructive word making its seemingly unstoppable way toward the lips to do its damaging work. Positively, Paul imagines any negative expression not being just stopped, but replaced by a statement that exhibits three criteria. It, one, is looking for building up, two, fits the occasion, and three, gives grace to those who hear, as we would find in Ephesians 4.29. If only all our words could be like that. Wednesday, August 16, The Holy Spirit in the Believer's Life in discussing sins of speech within the Christian community, what exhortation does Paul share about the presence of the Holy Spirit with believers? We read this first in Ephesians 4 verse 30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Paul simultaneously offers a daunting warning and a heartwarming promise. Our sins against one another in the church are not minor misdeeds with little consequence. What grieves the Holy Spirit is our misuse of God's gift of speech to tear down others. As we read in Ephesians 4, verses 25 to 27, Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbour, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. And then, verse 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And verses 31 and 32, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamour and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. That Paul echoes Isaiah 63.10 underlines the serious warning, and that verse is, But they, Israel, rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore he turned to be their enemy, and himself fought against them. In a reassuring promise, Paul affirms that the Holy Spirit seals believers from the day they accepted Christ in chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, in whom you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Glory, until the day of redemption, as we've just read in Ephesians 4 verse 30. The Spirit's relationship with the believer is not fragile, but durable. When believers disregard the indwelling presence of the Spirit by weaponizing God's gift of speech, the Spirit is not said to leave, but to grieve. 
The Spirit intends to remain present with the believers, marking them as owned and protected by God until Christ's return. Paul underlines the full divinity of the Spirit as the Holy Spirit of God and highlights the personhood of the Spirit by portraying the Holy Spirit as grieving. As we read in Romans 8 verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And verse 26, likewise the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 10, But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. And verse 13, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And then 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 11. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. And Galatians five seventeen to 18. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit... You are not under the law. We must tread with care in discussing the mystery of the Godhead. The Spirit is both one with and distinct from the Father and the Son. As Paul Peterson writes in God in Three Persons in the New Testament, published by the Biblical Research Institute, in 2015, page 20, he writes, The Spirit has his own will and chooses accordingly. He can be grieved and blasphemed against. Such expressions are not fit for a mere power or influence, but are characteristics of a person. Is the Spirit then a person just like you and me? No, we use limited human terminology to describe the divine, and the Spirit is what human beings can never be. End of quote. And so to finish the day, it is the Holy Spirit of God who lives in such intimate contact with us that our actions are said to affect Him. We share life with a member of the Godhead committed to us in a durable relationship that seals us until the end of time. What should be our faith response to this amazing truth? Thursday, August 17. Kindness, not bitterness. By referring to the day of redemption in Ephesians 4 verse 30, Paul has just invited his readers to consider their uses of speech in the context of Christ's second coming. Ephesians 4 31 and 32 then may be understood as addressing the use of speech as we approach that grand event. In the light of Christ's return, what attitudes and behaviours related to speech should be discarded? What attitudes and behaviours should be embraced? Ephesians 4, verses 31 and 32. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamour and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. In the final exhortation of Ephesians 4, verses 17 to 32, Paul again provides a negative command, this one identifying six vices that are to be put away from you in verse 31. A positive command to be kind, tender-hearted and forgiving in verse 32, and a rational owl. Believers are to forgive one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. The list of six vices begins and ends with general all-encompassing terms, all bitterness and all malice. 
In between come four additional terms, wrath, anger, clamour and slander in verse 31. The last of these translates the Greek word blasphemia, which English has borrowed as a technical term for demeaning speech against God. However, the Greek term identifies speech that defames either God or other humans as slander or evil speaking. In the list, attitudes, bitterness, wrath, anger, seem to boil over into angry speech, clamour and slander. In essence, Paul demilitarises Christian speech. The attitudes that drive angry speech and the rhetorical strategies that employ it are to be removed from the Christian's arsenal. Christian community will flourish and unity of the church will be fostered only when these things are laid aside, as we compare Ephesians 4 verses 1 to 16. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But to each of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended, what does it mean? but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Evil speech, though, is not so much to be suppressed as replaced. Our conversations and actions among the family of Christ and beyond it as well are not to grow out of anger, but are to be motivated by kindness, tender-heartedness and forgiveness based on the highest standard of all, the forgiveness that God has extended to us in Christ, as we read in verse 32. Paul presents vertical forgiveness offered by God to us as the model for horizontal forgiveness, that which we offer to each other. Ephesians 4.32 reads, And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And we compare that with Colossians 3.13, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. And Matthew 6 verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And verses 14 and 15, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So to finish the day, think about the power of your words. How can you use them to be uplifting, encouraging and faith-building? Friday, August 18. Writing in the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald of June 5, 1888, Ellen G. White 
says this, Let your conversation be of such a nature that you will have no need of repentance. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. If you have love in your heart, you will seek to establish and build up your brother in the most holy faith. If a word is dropped that is detrimental to the character of your friend or brother, do not encourage this evil speaking. It is the work of the enemy. Kindly remind the speaker that the word of God forbids that kind of conversation. End of quote. How would your congregation change if you and each member were to take and live a pledge consisting of such statements as the following? And there are four statements. One, I wish for my influence within the Seventh-day Adventist Church family and beyond to be positive, uplifting, faith-building and morale-boosting. As we read in Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. And two, recalling Christ's calls for unity and love, I will expend more energy affirming those things and saying things I believe to be good than in pointing out the failings of those I believe to be wrong. John 13, verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. And John 17, verses 20 to 23. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them, as you have loved me." And Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 9 to 11. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort one another and edify one another, just as you also are doing. And three, when I do disagree with someone, I will make my respect for my fellow believer clear. I will assume his or her integrity and commitment to Christ. I will offer my differing opinion gently, not stridently, as you read in Ephesians 4, 31-32. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamour and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And 4. I will live joyfully, looking for every opportunity to build up and affirm my fellow church members as I await the return of Christ. We read Ephesians 4, 29 and 30. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And Galatians 6 verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And Hebrews ten twenty four and 25, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching.
And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. 1. Review the 11 times in Ephesians that Paul describes the three members of the Godhead as working closely together for the salvation of humankind. How does this repeated emphasis inform our understanding of the Godhead? And firstly, we go to Ephesians 1 verses 3 to 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the Beloved. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, which He made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure which He purposed in Himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory." In him you also trusted after you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, to the praise of his glory. And then Ephesians one fifteen to 23 Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And Ephesians 2, 11 to 18. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near, for through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. And Ephesians two nineteen to 22 Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in 
the Spirit, and Ephesians 3, 1 to 13. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore I ask you, do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. And Ephesians 3, verses 14 to 19. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the width and length, and depth, and height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. And Ephesians 4, 17, sorry, sorry, Ephesians 4, verses 4 to 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in you all. And now for Ephesians four seventeen to 24. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of your mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And Ephesians 4:25. To 32, therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbour, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin, do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labour, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamour, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And Ephesians five fifteen to twenty. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. 
Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Ephesians 6, verses 10 to 20 where the Lord in Ephesians 6.10 refers to Christ. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand." Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And question two. How does Paul's counsel about Christian speech in Ephesians 4, 25 to 32 apply in the age of computer-mediated communication, which is too often used for cyberbullying and anonymous online character assassination? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla. Thank you, Sibylla. Real Divine Healing, Part 5, by Andrew McChesney. Almira told her parents about her decision to become a Seventh-day Adventist. She also told them about taking the forbidden classes on the supernatural, the appearance of the evil spirit and the persistent nightmares. Mother wept. If the church helps you, go, she said. After her baptism... Almira was never bothered by the spirit again. Today, Almira H. Yalchiva, 46, is a linguistics teacher at Zaoksky Adventist University in Russia. Her husband, Kemil K. Yalchiv, whom she met and married while studying at Yakotsky in the later 1990s, is a pastor and the vice president for student affairs at the university. Before working at the university, the couple served for a decade as missionaries to non-Christian people in Russia's North Caucasus region, part of the 1040 window. More recently, the couple earned higher education degrees from the Adventist International Institute of Advanced Studies, AIIASA, in the Philippines. Almira also is a mother, and she has a rule at home forbidding all children's cartoons and books that mention magic. After her own experience with evil spirits, she believes that there is no such thing as good or bad magic. All magic opens the door to Satan and his evil forces, she said. Sometimes a parent will ask her, what will my children talk about with their friends if they don't watch cartoons? She tells them that there are more interesting things to watch and discuss, including documentaries about animals and nature, if they choose to have screens in their homes. Almira's sister, Fania, is an Adventist, and their father worshipped with them on Sabbath before passing away. Their mother, now 75, regularly reads the Bible and Ellen White's writings. She no longer has the headaches that Almira had hoped to cure through the courses on the supernatural. After being baptised, Almira began to bring health magazines home from church. Mother read them and slowly her lifestyle changed. Once a drinker of only black tea, she replaced the beverage with fresh water and became physically active. The headaches went away 
Elmira's desire was fulfilled, but not in the way that she had expected. Mother was healed. Elmira prays to be a healing presence in many lives, saying, The daring step that I took to give my life to Jesus changed my life. A spoiled, selfish girl has been given the privilege of becoming the hands and feet of Jesus. My biggest desire is to serve him. This mission story illustrates mission objective number two of the Seventh-day Adventist Church I Will Go strategic plan to strengthen and diversify Adventist outreach across the 1040 window, IWillGo2020.org. Greetings, Sabbath School friends around the world. My name is Emma Garrick, a final year nursing student at Avondale University in Coorumbong, Australia. You have been listening to my grandfather, Percy Harold, reading the text of the Adult Bible Study Guide with this week's Sabbath School lesson. He has been doing this for free since 1996, long before I was born. Initially read as eyes for the visually impaired through Christian services for the blind in Australia and New Zealand, it became a podcast in July 2007, and so became available to anyone around the world. In 2021, Pa's podcast became the reading podcast for the official General Conference Sabbath School app, with daily recordings of each day of the lesson. The podcasts of the reading of the Sabbath School lessons are available from Hope Channel Australia, primarily on SoundCloud, and thence on multiple podcast rebroadcasters, including Apple iTunes. For several years, it has also been available in YouTube format, with the voice of my grandfather syncing in time with the scrolling of the text of the lesson, including all the reference texts. And for the visually impaired in the North American division, it is available on CD from Christian Record Services out of Nebraska. Hope Channel Germany distributes it to the blind in Europe. You are over one of 40,000 who listen every week around the globe. Tell your friends to look up my grandfather on the internet. It is simple. Just search for Dr. Percy Harold, select the site you want to listen to, make it a favourite on your device, and be able to listen again anytime you like. But downloading the General Conference Sabbath School app is a sure way to listen daily. That is the one with the blue rectangular icon with a stylized globe and three angels superimposed. And, as my grandfather would say each week, remember, God is always faithful.